Hello everybody, this is Jake from GeeklyNG, and welcome to our first game developer interview. I'm joined by Laura Shigihara today. Hi. Hello. How's it going? It's going great, I think. <laughs> if you are unfamiliar with Laura, she has created the soundtrack for Plants vs. Zombies and contributed music to games such as To the Moon, World of Warcraft, and High School Story. Primarily, though, we're here to talk about Rakuen, Laura's new game, which released May 10th on Steam. Go check it out. Links are below. You should play it. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but for those who have not had a chance to play the game, Laura, would you like to give a brief description on what Rakuen is? Sure. Um, so Rakuen basically is a game where you play as a little boy who is in the hospital, and one day you ask your mom to escort you to the fantasy world from your favorite storybook so that you can ask for a wish from the forest guardian from that world. Um, and in order to get a wish, you have to complete these challenges that revolve around helping five of your, I guess, fellow neighbors in the hospital uh, by interacting with their alter egos in the fantasy world. So it's uh, an adventure game. I guess you could say it's very heavily story-based, um, but there's definitely uh, puzzles and kind of mysteries, room escape puzzles, things like that, um, that I compare a bit to like Maniac Mansion. Um, there's a dungeon that feels a bit like Link to the Past, except without any battles. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I hope people enjoy it. <laughs> I've never played Maniac Mansion, but I've seen some of it played before, and all I really know is that you can microwave a hamster, which is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I played the, the NES version, so I'm not sure if they censored it for that one, but I remember reading about it, and I was like, oh my gosh. Oh, you could yeah. Uh, <laughs> I believe future versions past the mm -hmm. NES, uh, they censored it out. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> um, but my first console was a Super Nintendo, so. It's a great system. That's my favorite. I think. <laughs> pretty good. Um, but that's that's actually a pretty good segue uh, into my next question for you. Is um, what were some of the first games you remembered playing as a child, and do you think any of them influenced Rakuen a lot? Hmm. Well, definitely there were a lot that influenced it. Um, the very first games I played were like uh, shareware stuff on a computer that my dad brought home when I was really, really little. Like I remember playing um, Rogue and Castle and these kind of ASCII games. Um, but the first games I really got addicted to were like Super Mario Brothers and that series, the Mega Man series. Um, <clears throat> I played a lot of Capcom games and um, I remember the Disney licensed titles. From back then were really surprisingly good like ducktales and chippendales oh, yeah. and darkwing duck lion king was pretty good <laughs> yeah yeah i was surprised at the quality because a lot of licensed games back then were not very good so <laughs> um, but let's see i'd say um well obviously maniac mansion um uh, influenced a lot um uh, on the super nintendo chrono trigger secret of mana um those kind of old school jrpgs um probably played a big role as well because i I think it was the first time I experienced a game where I really felt like, oh, there's like a compelling story and I feel attached to the characters and the music really makes me um, feel more, um, I guess, engaged <laughs> in what's going on. And um, there was uh, a game on the PlayStation called Suikoden also that had a similar effect where um, there's one point where uh, some characters that you lose along the way, there's like a reprisal where they show up again and... Um, you play the game, so you know how that, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> affected mm -hmm. things. Um, but yeah, great. there's a lot of games like that. Um, I think Zelda, like specifically um, Zelda Link to the Past and Link Between Worlds, um, influenced a lot because I love the gating. I couldn't really do too much with that because I didn't want to turn it into, um, I, I think it wanted it to feel more like a, you know, heavily story-based game, but I really liked the aspect of, you know, you see some rocks blocking the path and, oh, what's behind there, you know, like that kind of <laughs> curiosity feeling. So I worked that into the game, um, as well as the cave dungeon layout and stuff like that. Well, I think you did a good job, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So when did you first decide that you wanted to make your own game? Because this is the first one you've ever released, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, the first one I've released, I, I had a kind of a hobby project before called Mellow Loon um, that I got pretty far along with. 
Um, but never ended up finishing it because um, I went to go work for EA and I just didn't have time to, to get back into it again. Um, I guess pretty early I wanted to make a game like when I was a kid. Um, I remember drawing like Mega Man levels on paper and writing out RPG plots and stuff like that. But um, it was obviously quite far off at the time. I'm like, wow, how does someone make games? <laughs> That'd be so cool. I mean, uh, I, I was five when I decided that I wanted to make a game. And then when I turned mm -hmm. six, I was like, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you kept with it. <laughs> I've actually been following the game's development for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I was super interested when you first announced it. Uh, but y you planned to release it originally in 2014, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. But <laughs> got got pushed back a couple of years. Um, yeah. <laughs> are you okay with talking about, I guess, how the game changed within those three years of development? Sure, yeah. Um, let's see. I think originally we weren't going to have as many characters. Um, I think it was going to be, um, well, I should start by saying that the game began as a, um, a crafting game, which is really weird. Like initially you would collect, um, <clears throat> different materials, you know, to make tools, to farm things and to, um, kind of work your way through the world that way. But so, that, uh, like if Minecraft was an RPG maker game. Yeah, um, but then I, I found out it was a little too, uh, I guess, the story was more linear, and that type of gameplay is more open-ended, and it just didn't really uh, match at the time, so I was like, okay, maybe JRPG, so we sort of shifted, um, and it was a more traditional oh, okay. JRPG battles and stuff, but then it just felt a bit kind of, uh, it, that didn't really fit either, because you go from the hospital and suddenly you're battling kobold spirits, and it was like, oh, it just <laughs> Makes sense. So we finally settled on um, the kind of, I guess, point and click adventure style. Um, and that seemed to fit really well because I could work in puzzles that fit with the story and I could kind of disseminate little pieces of inf information gradually. And I'm like, oh, okay, we finally got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think one was just kind of finding the feel for the game, um, expanding on the characters. Um, I would also say that like I had to take a break because of some life stuff um, and health issues going on. Um, so there were times that I didn't work on it and that kind of pushed it out as well. And then at the end, just um, taking care of a lot of stuff that like the art polish, we wanted to swap. Like originally there was all this licensed art still left in the game, like RPG Maker graphics. And I was like, you know, we came this far. We might as well like make it look as good as we can. So we overhauled everything. You know, we took all the RTP out. I think the only RTP in the game is there intentionally as a joke, which are the signs, um, because I oh. made them like a race in the game. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that took a long time. And then just like all the things like getting it onto Steam and doing all the achievements and the integration and um, setting up the, the Mac and the Linux port. Um, we got to work with some uh, really wonderful people for that. Um, and yeah, it was just like a lot of little odds and ends. So I guess you could say the game got a lot more fleshed out <laughs> over, over those years. Well, that's probably good. I guess it's just a little bit of everything that ended up pushing mm -hmm. it back. Yeah, yeah. Um, Worth the wait, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but that's also a great uh, segue. You know, it's it's finally out. So, what is it like finally finishing and hearing a lot of the positive feedback? Because I've I've looked at other reviews across different websites, and I, I think my review, and uh, ironically, gave you the lowest score, and it was like an <laughs> eight point five. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I'm surprised because to me, I feel like at the end of the day, I made the kind of game I wanted to play. And I, I've always felt like the kinds of games I played were not as, well, obviously a lot of people like Chrono Trigger, you know, or Final Fantasy, but I felt like some of the games I enjoyed were games that not many people knew about, like EVO, The Search for Eden, you know, <laughs> or uh, Shadowgate was kind of a point of quick adventure I liked. Um, so I... I don't know, I guess I just was afraid people would either uh, find the puzzles too easy or too hard, or um, they would want a game that was more purely exposition or more purely puzzles. And I, I guess I just am surprised that people are enjoying it so much and relate to the characters. And 
I'm really happy <laughs> because I, I think my goal with all of this was I just wanted, I was telling people that if the game could move someone in a positive direction or they would step away feeling hope or feeling like they wanted to do something good or I, I don't know, something like that, then I would feel really happy about that. And so once I started reading those comments, I, I was really happy. And then I think the first um, live stream that I watched was this guy, I Casper, and we actually were um, sitting there, you know, watching the whole stream. We watched it to the end and seeing him like start crying at the very ending part, Aww. you know, like, yeah, <laughs> but that's boiling anything. And then the whole room was in tears, and I was just like, "Oh!" And he said some, something really nice to us at the end, and um, it was just oh, it was such a good experience. Um, it's it's been kind of, I guess, a big emotional roller coaster because it's like you know I'll get a good review and I'll feel I'll feel really happy, and then I'll you know someone will leave a comment um like oh stupid RPG maker game, and then I'll be like oh, and then <laughs> you know, and then like the Polygon review came out, and I was like screaming, you know, we were jumping up and down. I called my mom in tears. I was really happy, and um, and I th I think it's just been a really good experience, and really I'm just really thankful if people found the characters relatable, you know, or enjoyed the dialogue, or got my weird sense of humor. Like yeah, it just. <laughs> It's, it makes me feel really happy. <laughs> that's that's great. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> All right. So uh, we've gone through sort of some of the setup questions. So I'm going to go ahead and leave a warning for any of those who might be listening now. I'm about to start asking some core game questions, and they contain spoilers. So if you have not played Raccoon, please pause the video or turn it off or come back to it after you've played it. Let's see. Because of the way you answered the last question, um, that, that leads me to ask this. I think the ending is pretty sad, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're thinking about Sue and the boy and what happens to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yet somehow I did come away from the game feeling pretty hopeful. So what were you going with the ending specifically? Did you want people to be sad or hopeful or a mix, perhaps? Well, I'm glad you said that because um, I did want people to feel hopeful. I think um, the overall message that I wanted to come I wanted people to come away from was that, um, you know, the boy, the mom, they're both going through some pretty awful times, you know, and um, I think it's like a lot of times with people when it rains it pours you know like bad things happen sometimes it's not like you know oh you you've had your one bad thing for the year you're you're good now you know a lot of times it's like no nope, stuff keeps coming <laughs> and i think that um what mom was trying to teach boy was that a lot of times you have a lot of power over how things are going to go you know like you you can't control what's happening to you or your circumstances but you can choose to look at it in different ways and I think that the idea that they go to this other world that they have this sort of beautiful way of looking at things changes the perspective a lot and um, initially the boy you know he could have wished for anything but symbolically his wishing to go to Rockland was kind of his coming to terms with things and sort of choosing to look at it in this beautiful way I guess instead of caving into just all his bad feelings and thoughts and stuff like that and um, I kind of wanted to say in life, you know, we're going to encounter a lot of things, you know, good things, bad things. And um, the more we can look at it as like, oh, maybe there's some meaning to this, you know, maybe there's some positive thing, you know, maybe I can't do too much, but I could still be a hero for somebody by listening to them. Um, you know, like we're all in this together, you know, the more we can look at it in a beautiful way, the, the better it is. So I guess that was the message. You know, one of the messages <laughs> I, I was hoping. <laughs> would that, that's a good mindset. I like that as a message. Um, but yeah, though it was sad, I, I think you did a good job at leaving hope for people there. Mm, thank you. So a couple of stories I want to talk about are, um, some of the character arcs in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. specifically, I really liked Gemma and Tony's stories. Mm -hmm. They were very relatable to me. Oh, um, good. And Tony's story, uh, at least when he was reading the letter that his daughter gave him that mm -hmm. had me crying oh. <laughs> <laughs> that that one got me more than any other moment in the game actually oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that made me very curious uh if you know any of these patients are based on people you know in your life that might have experienced similar struggles 
Mm. Yeah, Tony is actually based on my grandpa. <laughs> and I will say, like, a, there is a lot of stuff in the game that comes from my, my life, um, but most of it is at least partially allegorical. Um, like, I, I try to write a lot of the stories in a way that it could be more universal. Um, because obviously, you know, with Tony's story, it's not just about losing a child. It's more about the relationship between, um, you know, what happens afterwards. Like the idea that because of a miscommunication, you know, a parent and a child could completely lose, you know, their relationship because... You know, one, it's so easy, especially for a child to think the parent doesn't love them or doesn't care about them. You know, in that generation, a lot of, I think a lot of parents um, were not as, well, nowadays I feel like there there's more emphasis on communicating with kids and emotions and, and all that stuff. But back then, you know, I know for um, my grandpa, he didn't really express a lot of things. And um, I think it's, it's relatable because, you know, kids want their parents to love them and approve of them and stuff like that and um i tried to write that in such a way that maybe people could understand because of that you know like like for me personally i know that feeling of wanting to you know like not wanting to let your parents down like for me the line that really gets me is when <laughs> when she says i'm sorry dad because in her eyes she failed him you know but it wasn't even her fault you know so yeah yeah I've, but yeah, a lot. <laughs> I've i've never really had an issue with my parents either like i know that they're proud of me and i, I love them um but i guess just the idea yeah of it not being that way is what got me i think mm -hmm. yeah like the whole miscommunication thing or like i don't know anytime i see people reconcile with their parents after a long time like and it sort of hits me like man this can happen like no matter what age you are <laughs> like a parent can be like you know seen like in their 80s or something and still you know have to work out stuff with their kids and um yeah <laughs> thanks for sharing that oh, no problem <laughs> Um, I went ahead and told you my favorite characters so I'm curious if you have any favorite characters yourself <laughs> if you can if you can make that you know distinction uh -huh. um i really like sue i think that sue is a lot in a lot of ways like when i was writing her lines i was thinking a lot about um how did I respond to things when I was a kid? You know, I was and still am quite a dreamer. You know, I was kind of always in my head imagining things and stuff like that. And um, to give an example, um, I was walking around in my backyard when I was trying to figure out how to write the stories for some of the marbles and the um, amber marble. Um, this is going to sound really weird, but there was this corner in, of the yard where my sisters and I and like our friends, we used to play back there and we'd make stuff up, you know, we'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm 22 years old and I'm a wizard and I have these powers, you know, and oh, our island is getting invaded um, by bad guys. And, oh, we have to climb to the top of this tree and get magical potions and, you know, just like <laughs> stupid leaves. <laughs> and um, this tree was like this wise tree that would give us advice. And as I was walking around back there, I kid you not, there was a marble, an amber-colored marble, <clears throat> sitting in the roots of the tree. And I don't know where it came from. I, I can only assume that one of the neighbors, maybe like it got thrown over the fence or something like that. But I thought it was the craziest thing. <laughs> I picked it out of the tree and I was like, oh my gosh, this tree <laughs> gave me advice when I was a kid. I went and I washed it off and I have it sitting with me. Um, it's in like a little jar in one of the latest videos I posted, but um, it's just stuff like that. Like I think Sue's kind of like a space case. She's always like thinking of stuff and thinking of other meanings and making things up. And um, I just really like how she handles things, you know, like all the stuff that she's going through. I when players experience it, I sort of want them to see, oh, the marbles represent, you know, every time something crazy was happening you know in her household and she had to run away and she was scared she would make up a world you know so each marble each tiny planet is her way of dealing with things and I just like that she was able to do that I guess and she's kind of a real she feels real to me <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting backstory on I guess where the marbles came in <laughs> but let's see besides that um uh, Jackie cracks me up. Jackie's one of my friends in real life. He's an engineer and he's very, um, he loves his job. And I've, you know, he'll go on and on about, oh gosh, the technology behind per perpetual motion machines is fascinating, Laura. Do you know about this? You know, <laughs> he'll talk about it. He, he actually told me the beanbag thing, like at Star Night when 
Jackie's talking about like being bag area, just being like surface area. Like that's what he talks about. He's like, yeah, I was in Reno the other weekend and I was calculating the surface area and how fast I need to throw it. And, you know, I've got this place on the lockdown. I, I want all the stuffed animals. <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of cracks me up. <laughs> uh, I also like Jackie. I remember um, I took a screen cap of Jackie saying something about if he could lay eggs, he'd be laying <laughs> eggs all the time. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is part of the same question, but do you have any particular favorite songs from the game as well? Ooh. Um, I really like the final song, <clears throat> Mori no Kokoro. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is just, I had that whole scene in my mind from the very beginning. Um, in fact, actually the... The song that plays, the one called Kasane, which means like to mom, mm -hmm. and the one that plays when you're on the pier about to get on the boat. Um, <clears throat> when I was stuck, you know, in the story or I was trying to get motivated, I'd sit at the piano and I would play that song and just kind of play the scene in my head and just imagine it. Um, and I remember thinking, like, will I ever get to that point in the game? You know, it feels so <laughs> far off. And I just really... Well, I'm a game composer that's been my career for a while, so I really wanted to do something special with the music. And specifically, I like writing songs with words. Um, and so I kind of imagined, you know, in a lot of games, um, especially RPG and adventure games, you can collect like five, you know, I gotta get the, the eight magical gems, I gotta get the swords of power, I gotta get the, you know. And I'm like, what if you got songs? And um, each song kind of encapsulates like, the person's backstory or what they learn or what they're hoping for um something to do with their unfinished business and and then the idea that we're all in this together i kind of imagined you know what if all five parts combined to create a harmony because i love one of my favorite things to do when i write songs is the harmonies i always record um <clears throat> like different harmonies and that part's really fun to me so i was like oh that would be really fun to do and i remember um early on writing the parts and um i don't know if you're familiar with um Spelunky? uh i have it on my steam but i've never actually played it oh okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's, that's okay i was gonna say the person who did um programming for Spelunky, andy hall um he's also making a new game called dunk lords um he did the voice for tony and um, he was visiting one year for GDC and we were sitting at the piano and he was singing Tony's part and I was singing mom's part. And um, it was so fun. <laughs> and I just remember thinking like, oh, this is cool. Every time I'd write a new section, I'd kind of try to make sure that it fit together. I did a lot of tweaking to make sure all five melodies sounded good. I put a lot of effort into making sure that scene <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. came together and felt as hopefully, you know, felt as grand as it did in my mind. Um, and it just felt a bit unconventional for a final scene I guess um, so that when I get to that point to me it's not just that part of the game it's also sort of like the journey of the game and feeling like oh I'm actually at this part like I, I so many times during development I didn't think I was going to finish the game so it, it holds a lot of meaning I guess in, in that regard <laughs> oh okay and uh, correct me if I'm wrong um, Mori no Kokoro that's the name of the song Assuming my Japanese is correct, that means song of heart? Um, heart of the forest. <laughs> Pretty close, yeah. Well, <laughs> gotta work on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you got the general idea. <laughs> yeah. Alright, what do you think was the hardest individual challenge to overcome in making Rakuen? Like, specifically, was there a part of the story that was difficult to write or was it creating a piece of music or anything like that hmm. i think just sticking with it for that long was really hard for me because <laughs> um <clears throat> i have a lot of different ideas and things i want to do and i'd see people all the time go like i'm gonna make this like 60r rpg you know <clears throat> with all original assets and um it just takes a long time and so people would kind of fall off eventually and I think um, many times I wanted to do something else and I was like no I gotta stick with it um, and I think that was that was tough especially towards the end it, it got really stressful um, fixing a lot of the bugs and just being I didn't having to multitask so much like going from doing programming and then oh we need to fix this 
this other thing. Oh, I got to do a pixel animation for this. Oh, now I have to like write this press release thing. Now I have to like just bouncing around and all the things to take care of. And I think just um, sticking with it for that long was was pretty tough. I guess I also had trouble um, after after Tony's section figuring out. Um, I wanted to put funny stuff in the game, and I really wanted to have the Monsieur Buds um, section, you know, and like how to make that all come together was challenging for me because I think one of the things I wanted to do um, was like for me in the beginning of a JRPG, I need the turn based battle or the puzzles or something like that to um, make the cutscenes mean something. Because I've played some games where it's really heavy on exposition and I just don't care about anything. I'm just like, eh, I'm, I'm kind of antsy, you know. But if I fight a lot, you know, or. Um, do a bunch of puzzles and then I get a a cutscene I'm just like yeah I earned it (laughs) and I really want it but then by the end of the game I just really want exposition and so my goal was to have more gameplay early on and then transition to more exposition later once the player cares about um, the characters and the story and stuff like that and I think finding that balance was pretty tricky and so we did a lot of like beta testing and iterating during that time um, figuring out what to do for Monsieur Bud's section at first I was going to have this more complicated mystery going on but then I'm like ah, kind of wanted to be just silly and, and you know pretty fast and lighthearted and um yeah I guess just what do you call it decision fatigue there's just so many decisions to mm-hmm. make yeah uh <laughs> it, it's funny you mentioned that because when I started the Monsieur Bud section I thought it was going to be like a much deeper mystery than <laughs> oh no he's just eating the crumble in his sleep yeah. I guess <laughs> 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 but that was yeah. fine. I, I I don't think there is, you know, any issue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I want to talk about Morizora's Forest for a minute. That going there for the first time is very interesting, because for the first hour or so, you're kind of stuck in a dull gray hospital. Mm-hmm. And I think that scenery is intentional, right? Right, yeah. Um, it kind of desaturated the colors and... I made it less uh, exciting. <laughs> but when when you get to the forest, it's beautiful. Like, it feels fresh and new, but at the same time, it kind of... It, it held kind of a sense of familiarity for me. Um, mm-hmm. Or kind of an idea that you're supposed to be there, or that you have a place. Mm-hmm. Did anything inspire this world, whether it be past video games or just any real-world places? Hmm... Um, let's see. Well, I really, really liked the art in Legend of Mana. Um, because even though it was PlayStation and that was at a time when everyone was doing like <clears throat> kind of the new low poly 3D look and everything, that game still had sprites and a lot of hand painted artwork. And I just thought it was so beautiful. I loved the kind of storybook feel, like the the house and the tree and the rock. Everything, well, not the rock, but the house and the tree was really curvy and kind of um, squishy looking. Like it was unrealistic but realistic at the same time um so i think in terms of art style that um was very inspirational um i like the floating islands thing i've always liked that whether you know kingdom of zeal and chrono trigger or um in rapita you know like the the floating island um i've always liked that so i I wanted to have that there beanstalks feel magical to me yeah i guess there's a lot of stuff (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a lot of stuff where I'm like, that felt magical, that felt magical, let's put that in there. Uh, as far as the floating islands, have you ever played Cave Story? I played a little bit of it, yeah. Okay. Play, more, <laughs> play more Cave Story. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> it's, it's all about that kind mm-hmm. of thing. <laughs> That's um, cool. Anything else, or? Um... I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff here and there. A lot of old, like, Super Nintendo, um pixel-based games. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's more, but I just can't <laughs> think of it off the top of my head. <laughs> no, that's fine. So one of the key plot points in the game's real world is, you know, the, the world outside of the forest, um, is the tsunami, you know, the tsunami <laughs> that a lot of people died to, including Boy's father. Is this sort of directly based on the tsunami that occurred in Japan in 2011? Yeah, um... So it, the characters obviously aren't like um, like real uh, people, um, and the articles and stuff. They were um, so yes. I, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> but it, it was based on that. Um, actually, the whole game started because I wrote a song called "Jump," 
for the Play for Japan album, which was a good charity album started by the Silent Hill composer Akira Yamaoka. And、um, when I was writing the song, I was kind of imagining a music video at the time or a story about, you know, a boy in the hospital and his mom、um, taking him to this other land. They br-、uh, braid. Bed sheets and like climb out the window and take a train to this other world. And I guess I was just like imagining things、um, at the time. And so、um, my friend Emmy, who、uh, we worked at EA together, and she ended up moving. And when we hung out again, and she was like, oh yeah, let, you know, we talked about doing a, a music video for the, the song.、Um, and when we got together to hang out, she showed me a bunch of concept art. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. You know, we should make a whole game instead. So I think that was right around that time. And a lot of the stories and a lot of what was going on, I'd been reading a lot of things in the news. My、um, family on my dad's side, the Japanese side, is all from Sendai,、um, which is where all of that took place. And so I was reading a lot about you know, different personal stories about things that happen to people. And I guess I just. I thought a lot about that. I thought a lot about the concept of gaman, which is like、um, this Japanese thing where you kind of, it's like integrity through quiet suffering, I guess. And a lot of my relatives are very big on that to a point where,、um, you know, like I think Americans, you know, we kind of vent, you know, like if I have a bad day, I'm going to vent about it. Oh, you know, like work was tough and oh, this person cut me off and blah, blah, blah. But, Same.、Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a way to bond and stuff. But、um, my, A lot of my older relatives from like older generations,、um, they won't do that. Like my aunts, it was very difficult to get them to complain about anything. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that it's like, you know, kind of a thing to, you know, you keep it inside and you quietly endure, and there's like a dignity in that. And、um, I think I wanted to show that a lot with mom, what she was going through,、um, because she probably, you know, was going through a whole bunch of stuff. And、um, I wanted that to suddenly become clear to the player when the, the boy. Points out because he's very empathetic, you know, like, what about you, mom? Who's going to be there for you? And、yeah. I think that was his struggle as well, feeling like,、um, oh, mom is so strong, you know, I can't have these negative emotions, and that's how Yami manifests. So at the, by the end, you know, she kind of hugs both of them and is saying, like, like it's okay, you can have both sides, you, you know, like, it's good to, to endure and look at things in, in a positive way, but it's also okay to feel sad and, you know, feel scared and angry and all that.、Um, But, anyways, all that was kind of in my mind、um, when I was writing it. So, I did want to connect、um, those real world events. So, a lot of the articles you see、um, are based off of real articles with just a little bit changed, you know, or I'd highlight certain sections to kind of point out what was going on. Yeah.、Okay. I liked reading all the articles because I'm into, you know, lore and stuff and、oh, games. <laughs> <laughs> But that does bring me to another question. I guess Yami is sort of、uh, part of this and the negative emotions, but、um, when I started college, I started really getting into sort of the pixel horror games, and I really loved the creepy sections you had with the envoy.、Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, it made me uncomfortable, but it, it was like at that point, games were really giving me a thrill、uh, when I started playing creepy sections like that.、Um, but、uh, oftentimes, people are kind of surprised that pixel horror games can be scary at all.、Um, yeah. So, were these scenes hard to create?、Um, not so difficult. It was more just like I tried to think of what would freak me out. You know, for me, if something slightly different, it freaks me out. Like, there's one part where you walk by and you see the. The boy with his hair still、um, in a bed. And then when you walk back again, he's gone.、Um, that kind of subtle stuff freaks me out. Or like dynamic audio. I did something where when you get closer to the clocks, they play louder.、Um, uh, there's yeah, random don't noises. Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> there's little strange Easter eggs. Like if you flip the lights on and off a certain number of times, Envoy will appear. There's just like a lot of stuff worked in and、um, the ambience.、Um, As well. I just wanted to find something that felt unsettling.、Um, I don't know. I, I actually had a lot of fun <laughs> putting that part together because I, I also like that kind of tense feeling, you know? And so I guess constructing it was、um, more fun than I thought it would be. You know? Okay. The, I think the scene that probably、uh, freaked me out the most wasn't actually playable, but when, he's, when, when Boy is talking to Yami. And he agrees to go with Yami, and Yami turns into an、uh, envoy. And I was like, ah.、Oh. And then the boy turns into an envoy. I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh good, I'm glad that was effective. <laughs> yeah, that that caught me off guard. But it was it was good. It was good. Okay. Um so that's pretty much everything I wanted to ask about the game itself. Spoilers are over now. Uh, not that I imagine people would, would be skipping around in the video if they heard <laughs> spoilers were there, but just in case, spoilers are, are done with now. Okay, uh, do you have any advice for anyone who wants to make a game? Maybe something that you kind of wish you knew before you started production on Rakuen? Hmm, let's see. I've got advice where it's like I knew about it before and then advice for where I didn't know about it before. <laughs> um, I guess one thing that was really helpful, I think having placeholders is great because um, especially people making RPG Maker games, they sort of look down on RTP, like the licensed graphics. Um, <clears throat> and so they're like, oh, well, I can't start until I get all this original art and original music and like all this other stuff done. But um, if you're just starting out and you still have to find an artist and um, you really want to get proof of concept out there, like I think it's really good to use placeholder art, you know, use placeholder whatever um, until you have either the gameplay down first, you know, like prototyping is really, really good. Um, you figure out if it's fun or not because I mean a lot of people I don't know a lot of companies in my opinion do this backwards I've seen them turn out all this art and all this music and all these assets and then they get their first build together and it's not fun and they're like oh shoot we can't you know make a game out of this it's oh, not fun boy. at all <laughs> and so it's like use programmer art use dots on the screen you know like just make sure that like you have that game down and before you make all that stuff because it'll waste time and money and you know, energy and stuff like that so do placeholder art and um prototype first let's see um lists are very helpful <laughs> <laughs> like keeping track of stuff i have so many lists and like check the things off you know like otherwise i mean making a game there's so many so many little things to keep track of um and it was fun looking back at my notebook because at the beginning i just had so many check check boxes and as time went on it was like you were in fewer things um so i knew i was like making progress um and the last thing i would say uh which is more of like a i guess this is like a life thing but um be aware that when you're not feeling good you know when you're feeling down that you're gonna have some thoughts that are you know negative self-defeating thoughts and you can't listen to them <laughs> because it happens like at the end of the day it happens when you're exhausted and you just start thinking like i don't know this this project kind of sucks like i don't, right. <laughs> I don't i don't believe in it you know and a lot of times if you let those thoughts get out of control you, you won't finish your project you just have to remind yourself okay this is just chemical you know i'm tired i i haven't eaten you know i need to get a good night's rest and chances are you know give it some time take care of your health um and later on you know you're gonna believe in it again and you're gonna see why you started it in the first place i can't emphasize that enough because i know so many people who you know give up on things because they get in that state where they're just like i'm so down there's no meaning to what i'm doing you know i don't see the point anymore but um if you stick with it you know there's a reason you started it and um yeah, so don't listen to that side. Take care of your health, eat right, you know, eat your vegetables and go on walks and drink enough water and, um, yeah. <laughs> I'll pretend thoughts like that are creepy in voice so I stay away yeah. from it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> okay, so now that you've finished this four to five year long project, might be a little early to ask, but do you have any plans for future projects? I do. Um, I'm still kind of um like stuck in all this stuff because there's so much stuff to do still like we I, I just put up a patch for testing today for the game and there's a lot of PR stuff I have to do um and yeah but I think one one thing I want to do is I want to release a, an album because like over the last I don't know four or five six years I've written so many songs that I've just not done anything with um and I would just really like to uh, record some of those songs or arrange them out and release an album. Um, maybe do some fun music videos or something like that for them. That'd be fun. Besides that, <laughs> I do have other game ideas in mind. Like, I've always wanted to make a game called No Holds Barred, 
which is about a bard <laughs> right. at a Ren Fair that gets pushed too far <laughs> and then goes on the rampage. <laughs> so, I'd play that I game. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that probably won't be for a while though, because I think I need a break from game development. I do have some DLC ideas in mind because there's so many little NPCs in Rockwind that I just love that have like weird personalities and culture and stuff. Um, and I think it would just be fun to release like like tiny little episodes, sort of like in Adventure Time or um, Wander Over Yonder, you know, like cartoons where they sort of focus on particular side characters and develop them a bit more. So I'd love to have, you know, a, a DLC about Sugar Baby and Rupert, you know, or um, maybe why why does P-Dog eat so much cabbage? Or, you know, <laughs> just like pick out some characters and, and develop them a bit more. I'd, I'd like to see uh, Tony after the pancake eating contest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's exciting. As far as uh, albums and original songs go, I've I've been a fan of your work for a while, and probably one of my favorite, I guess, sort of original songs is the song you made for Brewster from Animal Crossing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of fun with that one. <laughs> um, yeah, Animal Crossing keeps me sane. I play it, like, every day. I, I have not picked it up since December, and I'm almost afraid to go back because of all of the weeds I'm gonna have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I had the beautiful town ordinance, so when I came back I only had like three weeds, so I was like, oh wow, this is so different from earlier versions. <laughs> oh, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, the the we're update is off. real good. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> we're getting way off topic, uh, but yes, the, up <laughs> the update is good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I guess everything I've wanted to ask, I think, mm -hmm. has pretty much been covered. So, um, is there anything that you want to tell people about Rakuin that we haven't yet addressed? Um, I can't think of any- I never have anything good to say for these questions. Um, I guess just, I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, yeah, if, uh, if you like story, if you like, you know, getting to know characters and stuff like that, um, and weird puzzles and um then hope you check it out and hopefully you'll get something positive out of it and if you do thank you <laughs> i hope so too like i said links are down below this so you can download it there a big thank you to laura for joining us for this interview make sure you also check out her youtube channel at youtube.com supershiggy where you can find her original songs and covers you can also follow her on twitter at supershiggy all links are below and we hope you enjoyed the interview until next time